Hi everyone, welcome to another Port Jackson Securities webinar. I am your webinar host, Caitlin Chung, and today we are joined by Senior Business Development Manager, Chad Heitzman. Thank you so much for joining us today, Chad. Thank you for having um, us. So so Chad will um, give us a presentation on thematic investing and then we will take questions from the floor. So feel free to pop in questions into the que question section whilst he's presenting for the live Q&A. All right, Chad, I will hand it off to you. Okay, fantastic. Um, we'll just start the slideshow. And what I'll do is I'll keep it informal. So if, if there's any questions that you have, Caitlin, while I run through, just let me know. Um, I've realized yeah, sure. over the years presenting that uh, having it short and sharp and interactive is the best way to engage the audience. So um, I, I guess beginning from the beginning, I'll tell you a little bit about our firm, ETF Securities. Uh, we've been in Australia as an ETF provider since 2003, in fact. Um, our background is that we originated originated the world's first gold ETF, physically backed, and that's been used uh, by investors as a portfolio diversifier and equity risk hedge. Um, since 2003, we've expanded into equity ETFs, uh, and this is where it, it's getting interesting for us in devising ETFs over certain specific areas, um, and we're going to run through those today. So the other thing I should just preface um, the presentation with is the disclaimers here. Uh, this isn't to be taken as personal financial advice. Um, it's always best to consult a professional financial advisor just to have a better understanding of uh, the risks associated with ETFs, your own personal financial position, and so on and so forth. So with that out of the way, the agenda we have uh, for today um, a few itemized items there. We're gonna run through thematic investing in particular, and we'll define what that means, at least for, for us at ETF Securities. We'll touch a little bit about um, building a portfolio using uh, theme-based ETFs, and we'll cover some of our uh, exchange-traded funds specifically that are capturing certain investment themes where we think they have kind of structural growth pathways so in other words, there's durability to um, certain investment themes. And here is a, a broad brushstroke snapshot of some of our, uh, what we title, what we call future present range. Um, so there's a variety of ETFs there. For example, uh, we have a global developed markets technology ETF tech uh, at the top uh, of the screen there. And that encompasses all subsectors of technology from software as service, cybersecurity, semiconductors, and so forth. We do things uh, in the healthcare space, but specifically um, biotechnology. And we consider that to be something of an innovation incubator underpinning uh, broader healthcare. And there's certainly a demography story to be told in the aging of the population. Um, and we'll get into that. And you can see other uh, exposures we have from alternative energy, with our ETF ACDC, which is that energy storage technology um, ETF. We do hydrogen, uh, and then we also cover companies in robotics automation, and we cover FinTech companies as well, um, which we'll go through each in turn. And so starting from the start here, uh, just in terms of how do, how do you go about selecting a theme? Um, these are very kind of basic intuitive way uh, to do that. And let me just kind of set the stage by saying what we think thematic investing is. Um, so first and foremost, we think that it's associated with, with a mega trend. And what we mean by that, it's not just a, a fashionable thing that's happening today, but rather it's going to continue into the future. So again, you know, durability of the theme. Um, and then also in terms of longevity, um, it's usually, it has longevity precisely because it's sector agnostic, country agnostic. In other words, you're seeing it play out across sectors, uh, be it from uh, finance, agriculture, healthcare. So think of the adoption of certain technology, it's occurring across these sectors. Furthermore, it's not geographically isolated, but it's widespread. Um, and then, you know, it's, it does have a specificity of focus. 
Um, so we're talking about, I, I raised earlier healthcare, we're talking about robotics and automation and so on and so forth. So that's a very entry level way of thinking about thematic investing. And this too is a, a very kind of basic beginning point in, in how to think about putting an exchange traded fund that has a thematic orientation into your portfolio. And how we kind of think about this in portfolio construction terms is usually portfolios have a core, which is your mainstay, your main investment where you've heavily allocated most to, and then it goes to satellite exposure. Um, and then a tilt is more a short-term temporary opportunistic um, tilting of the portfolio, temporary terms. And so the way to think about this is that in as much as you have a longer investment horizon, uh, which is on the x-axis, and in as much as you have a high level of conviction uh, relating to a certain theme, you can see that as you go uh, up, that it can turn into potentially a core position or a satellite position. Satellite is just a more moderate size allocation um, that you'll have. So hopefully that just serves as a very simple way of thinking about portfolio construction. Um, it certainly can get very uh, intense very quickly in, in the way that you devise a portfolio, but keeping it in simple terms, um, that's a good diagrammatic way of approaching it. And so now we'll hop right into it um, in terms of the exposures we have on our side that serve as thematic vehicles. Uh, the first of which is our flagship equity fund um, on the equity side. Um, ACDC is the ticker code. And this is a 30 stock portfolio, roughly 30 stocks, global equity. So in other words, it's, it's not just strictly Australian companies, which have from time to time featured in this ETF. And the purpose of it is to capture the theme of the electrification of the economy. And this is the notion that in order for renewables to be better used in the economy, you have to have devices, transportation, that more or less plugs into the electrical grid, and then the electrical grid is run on renewable energy. Um, and so this particular ETF uh, is basically trying to capture that theme of the electrification specifically of transportation. So transportation for us is what we refer to as a low hanging fruit, an easy way to begin electrifying certain parts of the economy. Whereas electrifying a factory or larger scale activities such as those, it's a bit more challenging. Um, so we're focused specifically here on batteries used for transportation, there's other uh, applications as well. And so we target the entire value chain. And so this goes all the way from lithium miners. We have three lithium miners in the portfolio currently. These are the likes of Allchem, Hilbera Minerals, uh, Mineral Resources, so three names. And then after which it's spread out across a wide variety of other names in that value chain underpinning energy storage technology. And we'll run uh, through a few names there. And this specifically is that value chain, that supply chain that we're covering. So you have a little bit of an idea of the extent of it, all the way from mining to chemical processing um, and so forth. And I, we think it's a very interesting area. We realize there's a long runway for this in terms of, for example, the adoption of electric vehicles. It, it's very small in terms of the proportion of vehicles on the road now that are electric. Um, and keep in mind, in order for countries, economies to hit certain targets of emissions reduction, um, associated with that is going to be the need to increase electric vehicles on the road by 2040. So there's a statistic that we like to refer to, which says that for global emissions, reduction targets to be reached by 2050, uh, you need 900 million electric vehicles on the road by 2040. Um, just to give you a little bit of uh, texture there. And I mentioned a few of the holdings we had. You can see that the top 10 holdings, um, aside from the, the lithium miners I mentioned, um, there's a few interesting names there. You can also see that the sectors to which they attach, um, 
and the geographic breakdown. This is interesting because ACDC is global equity first and foremost. So you can see the countries that it covers um, all the way from Japan to the Netherlands. And you can see that it does have you know, kind of diversification across geographies. It's not solely linked, for example, to the United States, which tends to have a larger footprint in global equity indexes. Um, so that's good. You have a widespread uh, mix of countries. Uh, performance, um, just to touch on that briefly, you can see that it's done well since we launched it, although recently there's been headwinds uh, in equity markets this year for obvious reasons in relation to central banks raising interest rates um, to kind of quell inflation, which is out of the bottle at the moment, so to speak. And, but overall, performance has been uh, relatively well versus, say, a broader benchmark, the MSCI world. And to give you some insight into some of the companies we have, there is a company called Solar Edge Technologies out in the United States, and they make all the componentry parts uh, for basically solar panels, um, inverters, monitoring systems, and they've begun to do it also with electric vehicles. And the good thing about Solar Edge in the United States is that it has a, a very large market share of the residential solar inverter market. So that's good in terms of it having an economic moat, which we, we do like to see. And I'll go through each of our exposures here kind of in turn. Um, but if there are any questions, just let me know. And um, the sooner I get through these, we can address any questions you have. But in keeping with our focus on alternative energy, um, we also have exposure to companies in the hydrogen ecosystem. And the reason we're, we're having a diversified stable of alternative energy plays is because we think uh, in our estimation, that going forward for this energy transition, you're likely going to need a portfolio mix, if you will, of alternative energy solutions. In other words, there's not necessarily immediately going to be one size fits all. Um, you know, oil has been very easy to use and incorporate in economies. It's a universal input. It's standard. Um, but I don't think with alternative energy in the near term, there's going to be an end-all, be-all, one solution. And so for, from our thinking, we want to have a diversity of approaches to alternative energy. The second of which here is hydrogen. And this ETF covers 30 global hydrogen companies in developed markets, but also including Taiwan and Korea. Korea is an interesting country. It, it certainly does have... Uh, leading companies in this area, um, a few interesting ones that we can go through. And so just to give you an idea of what we're covering specifically, we're covering hydrogen fuel cells, so companies that produce those. We're covering refueling stations, hydrogen refueling stations. So that's the infrastructure aspect of this that needs to be built out. And to be sure, as a matter of fact, there's a lot still to be done in this space in, in regard to building up uh, transportation infrastructure that will allow for the adoption of hydrogen. Um, so, for example, in the United States, in terms of hydrogen refueling stations, it's very limited, in fact, no more than 10. Um, but this just points the way to kind of opportunity, at least for us, from our perspective, and having a long runway for growth. Um, however, this portfolio is certainly, you know, growth oriented, which means we're investing in companies that are not necessarily profitable today, um, but with the expectation that they're going to develop their technological capability over hydrogen and in turn, hopefully becoming more uh, profitable. And this speaks kind of to um, the opportunity set in relation to hydrogen. It's certainly linked uh, to basically reducing emissions to meet emissions reductions targets, as well as uh, global temperature um, standards. And you can certainly see on a revenue basis, in as much as uh, temperatures continue to rise and thereby start to push countries to more and more adopt alternative energy, uh, you know, revenue growth can certainly be um, good in this space. And you can also see the percent of the energy market taken up by hydrogen, it's very currently minimal. 
Um, so hopefully pointing the way to an opportunity to increase that in the overall uh, energy mix, which of course today is predominated by uh, fossil fuel. The next slide that we're gonna cover is just in terms of um, some insight into this particular ETF portfolio. And because it's global equity, which most of our thematic ETFs, all of our thematic ETFs, in fact, are global equity, we'll just run through, of course, the, co the country exposure. In this instance, you can see the United States makes up roughly 30% of the portfolio, but it's immediately followed by Britain, and I mentioned South Korea uh, is there with the heavier weighting as well. The other thing to mention in terms of portfolio insights is the types of companies it's covering in terms of company size. Um, you can see there that this is a small cap type exposure, which is less than 2 billion in terms of their, their market capitalization. Um, so this then, in other words, is a small cap global equity with a tilt towards specifically hydrogen companies. Um, these are all the angles by which you can think about a portfolio in terms of the theme it covers, in terms of the global equity it covers, in terms of the size of companies it's covering, and so forth. And here we run through our top holdings. You might not be fully familiar with some of the names there, but um, the great thing today is, is Google is there. And I would certainly urge you to, to look into some of those names. They're, they're certainly interesting. Um, and I'm going to go through a, a stock story shortly uh, for this portfolio. But in, in South Korea, for instance, there's a company called Fuel Cell Energy. They're not shown there in the top 10, but they're interesting because they're the world's largest clean energy power plant and it uses hydrogen to power roughly 135,000 homes. Um, so just to give a little bit more texture, and you can also see in the right side of the screen, some of the sub industries that we're covering here. Um, it's quite broad, but again, it, it is certainly just specifically focused on hydrogen. And performance recently to provide a snapshot here, some flavor here, because it's a growth portfolio, meaning that companies uh, in terms of profitability, in terms of you know, cash flow, free cash flow, the name of the game for these companies, in fact, is to just invest, reinvest. Um, so in other words, they're not necessarily profitable today. Um, so what that's meant in the current context of interest rates going up by central banks to tame inflation is that growth companies um, have been price pressured the most. But we're thinking that this could potentially be a good entry point to building longer term positions in as much as individual investors have conviction and longer time horizons um, to have something of an exposure like this. You can also see other characteristics in terms of volatility. So volatility, just to mention as a side note, speaks to the uncertainty, if you will, around the returns. So the wider the volatility means that it can go up or down. Um, so the higher number you see on there of 34%, it's, it's fairly volatile. So that means that you know, for investors, those who are usually longer term investors, that they realize the risks associated with these types of investing, it, it could be suitable. Um, and you can see some other uh, characteristics there in terms of performance. And I'm certainly happy to run through anything you wanna to touch on later in particular. Here's a snapshot, uh, another snapshot of a company. I initially mentioned fuel cell energy in South Korea. Um, this one, Power Cell, is a Swedish company. And again, it speaks to the fact that this is global equity uh, that we're talking about. Um, it makes hydrogen fuel cells. And hydrogen fuel cells, in a word or just a simple sentence, it's basically a stack of permeable membranes where hydrogen is married with oxygen to produce electricity. So in other words, you fit automotive uh, or transportation with fuel cells, and then that's how you power them with hydrogen, more or less. And you can see though that this company is fairly well established. It's, it's been around for over a decade, um, which is a, a good thing to have in the portfolio. 
The other thematic space we're going to delve into, dive into here, is in relation to biotechnology. Um, again, it's global equity, but to be clear, it's specifically U.S. biotechnology. Um, and we cover the entire uh, universe in this space. And what I mean by that is we go all the way from micro cap companies to small cap companies to larger size companies. It's a fairly diversified portfolio across this subsector of healthcare. So we've had over 130 to 160 names in the portfolio. Um, and we're thinking that, you know, in connection with things like the aging of the population, which is going to drive a need for more innovative medicine for certain treatments, that, you know, healthcare in terms of biotechnology is going to have increased focus. And another thing in terms of vaccines, you know, most recently with, with COVID and the pandemic, those have come into play as well. Um, so we'll go through some of the names that we have in there, but you can see that biotechnology includes gene therapy, vaccines, immunotherapy, and even more frontier stuff like gene editing, which is very interesting. You can see there the, the space in its entirety that we cover in terms of the classification of the sector here. Um, you can see that, you know, it goes all the way from pharmaceuticals and so forth. That's a great diagrammatic description of, of basically the space here that we're, we're covering. And here's some portfolio insights uh, in terms of, you know, the number of constituents, which means the number of stocks I mentioned, it's historically been upwards of uh, 130 names. So it's, it's fairly diversified across the subsector. Uh, there's some other interesting uh, characteristics there in terms of valuation. So P slash B is price to book. Um, so valuations have come down here because this sector or subsector in particular, as interest rates have gone up, um, have been very price pressured downward. So valuations are, are more attractive uh, today versus what they were um, last year. And you can see, as I mentioned, that we go all the way down to micro cap companies and small cap companies. So what that means is volatility, um, because these are lesser established companies. Um, but usually that's where the innovation occurs. It's very much a binary proposition, biotechnology is, in terms of win-lose and getting through uh, FDA clinical trials, stage one, stage two, stage three. Um, so a lot of small companies are specifically engaged with certain medicines trying to get through those trials. But you can see it's also made up of mid caps and mid caps, they range in terms of size between two to $10 billion US dollar terms. Um, and we do have some representation about 11% of large cap companies as well in the portfolio. You can see there the performance and what I mentioned earlier, because these companies are very growth oriented, because they're not necessarily immediately profitable, when interest rates go up, it means that their cost of capital goes up. Um, so they're revalued a little bit more aggressively uh, if that happens. So in the current, current interest rate rise environment, uh, they've been price pressured. Um, but as mentioned earlier, it means valuations are looking a bit more attractive um, going forward. And Gilead Sciences is, in terms of a stock profile for this uh, ETF of ours, is one that you probably heard about during the pandemic. Um, they do a multiplicity of things in relation to vaccines, um, but other interesting things like, like remdesivir, remdesivir, which was one therapy that they had during COVID. They're a fairly large, uh, larger company uh, in this space, um, and they also are in basically what they call orphan drugs. These are very rare diseases and you have these very expensive drugs to treat those rare diseases. Uh, so they're even engaged in HIV and, and so forth. And they have a rich pipeline of new drugs, uh, which we like to see that they're kind of diversified across different uh, treatments and areas and so forth. Now, getting toward the end here, just to give some further flavor and other exposures, exciting exposures we have, FinTech's another interest area for us. 
Um, so this here is a fairly well diversified subsector exposure, 75 uh, companies that we invest in. The sub themes here, it's quite broad, it's quite rich. We go all the way from blockchain companies uh, to buy now, pay later companies, to dig digital wallet companies. And you can actually um, go through statistics here. Financial services have the strongest expected uptake of blockchain technology of any industry, which is interesting. So in other words, you know, this is something of a sector agnostic play, but in particular, uh, financial services are, are taking it up and hence it's, it's, it's FinTech um, for that financial service technology. And here's some of the areas that we're covering, uh, a wide variety of things from personal finance, tax and compliance. Interestingly enough, on the tax and compliance side, we have H&R Block in the portfolio because they have a software for tax uh, use, which very much streamlines that for um, tax advisors digital payments, uh, data providers, we, we touch on in point of sale um, operators as well. And performance, you can see that it's it's been hit and price pressured again as interest rates are going up. But you know, from our standpoint, it's perhaps introducing an opportunity for investors with longer term time horizons to build uh, positions. And you can go back to the slide if you want to and and look at its volatility in terms of risk and, and so on and so forth. And even on our website, just to be clear, we have all this information for you to dive into if you want to more thoroughly ex, uh, explore some of the exposures here. And just winding up, I want to go right into the last thing here. This portfolio of ours, Robo, which is the ticker, is very interesting. Uh, it's basically a play, a stock play, where we invest in companies that are on-selling automation enabling robotics platforms into a variety of sectors, from agriculture to healthcare. On the agriculture side, we actually invest in John Deere within this portfolio because they have automated driverless tractors. Um, so it's a wide mix of sectors. It's any sector that's adopting this technology for productivity solutions, for labor saving solutions. Um, it's very interesting. And I should mention, which we're going to get into, uh, the opportunity set is interesting. Uh, in terms of, this is a sector agnostic uh, theme. It's gonna be across a variety of areas. And so we think that um, going forward, it's going to become a trillion dollar uh, space, which is a great uh, investment opportunity for us. And that's why we devise this particular ETF. And I wanted to mention with this specific exchange traded fund of ours, we actually partnered with a company in the United States called Robo Global, and they very well curate this universe in terms of stock selection. And they, you know, they finely tune the portfolio. And you can see some pretty heavy hitting names there, especially in relation to our strategic advisors, many of whom are from MIT. And they basically offer us advice in terms of you know, the areas that have commercial viability for certain robotics um, technology. And so that kind of points our compass in certain direction in terms of stock selection. So it's great that we have this particular investable index, this ETF, backed by those professionals. And those are some of the areas that we're specifically covering. It's very wide um, in terms of the sectors from industrials, uh, consumer discretionary, consumer staples, um, and so forth. And portfolio performance, once again, the, the commonality as mentioned is just higher interest rates, price pressuring stocks, you know, most stocks and sectors haven't been immune from this. In fact, the only sector that's positively performing year to date, the last that I looked at it was energy. Um, all the other sectors are, are very much struggling. Um, so that's kind of a common thread. Um, but since inception, you can see uh, its portfolio performance 7.2% per year uh, since we launched this fund back in 2017. And that's just a quick ending snapshot of some of the companies we cover. 
Um, logistics, in fact, is an area that's powered the portfolio in terms of performance since the beginning of this fund. And one of the specific companies that has been a positive contributor to performance is Zebra Technologies. And they basically are a logistics uh, streamlining company with kind of solutions to make it easier to track and trace packaging. For example, in terms of the shift from brick and mortar retail to e-commerce, you know, when something goes from the warehouse to your doorstep, Zebra tra Technologies enable the tracking of that package. Ocado is another interesting name, and they basically are a, a warehouse delivery fulfillment um, platform, but specifically for grocers. Um, so grocery delivery and, and automating that, Ocado comes into play. And Woolworths and Kohl's have partnered with Ocado um, to build out that capacity. And that's it. I'll end there. And as mentioned, we have our website um, for you as a reference point. If you want to call and, and discuss any particular ETF, we're happy to have a conversation. Um, but I'll turn it back to you, Caitlin, if, if there's any questions we, we can answer. Thank you so much, Chad. That was a really great snapshot. I wasn't actually aware that you guys were so global and covered so many different markets. Um, so this is a really good introduction into ETF securities. Um, for those that came in late, if you um, want to see the slides, you're welcome to email myself or Chad, um, who can send them over to you. Um, but let's hop into the questions. We have quite a few. Um, so one from myself, actually, which ETF performs the best last year and why? On our side, uh, one of our better performing equity ETFs has been ACDC. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason for that is, is uh, Biden within the United States and changing policy very much toward the adoption um, of electric vehicles. So that gave it a thrust in performance. Um, so that one was a high performer. And in fact, ACTC this year, uh, despite the drawdown in equities, has been more or less drawing down at levels associated with the S&P 500, not the NASDAQ. So all things considered, considered even this year, it, it's doing well. But last year, standout performer was ACTC. Yeah, I think there's definitely more and more increasing hype around electric vehicles. So I don't see that um, diminishing anytime soon. Um, are ETFs more for those who have a long-term outlook rather than those who are looking for short-term gains? You can devise a portfolio any which way you'd like to. So if you wanna be short-term, you can, you can be short-term, but there's many challenges in being short-term in terms of timing and so forth which there's a lot of pitfalls in, in attempting to do that. You know, the usual better way of doing things is long-term because then you can ride through volatility and then you don't, you know, get caught in a position where you buy high and you sell low rather than buying low, selling high. So the, the kind of stock standard axiom, if you will, is, you know, long-term investment is you have a better shot of capturing performance than you would if you're short-term opportunistic timing and, and so forth. So I, I would say, you know, the longer the better. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there. Um, and you noticed, uh, you, you mentioned a lot about um, thematic investing and megatrends. And so I was wondering from your point of view, which megatrend should the market be aware of the most? Well, there's a few there that we covered today electrification of the economy is one I, in all seriousness it, it just it does seem like energy transition is a very um top of the list thing because it's being powered by policy from governments and when that happens investors pay attention allocators pay attention because usually you'll also have government support in terms of spending um, or kind of favorable taxing and, and so all of these drivers are combining to make this particular thematic very much of interest top of mind to investors. Um, so I, I would simply say yet again, uh, electrification of the economy is one to watch. Hmm. Um, okay, I'll take two more. Um, are you guys releasing any ETFs um, anytime soon? 
Uh, well, yeah, we, we have a, in terms of new ETFs, there's a few on our minds. Recently, actually, we did a few fixed interest ETFs. Um, and as much as interest rates are rising, it just means that you can achieve you know, higher cash flow from fixed interest than you did previously when interest rates were zero. So that asset class is starting to come back and play and we just launched two new uh, ETFs for that category, which is gonna be interesting. But um, keep an eye out on our website for what we're gonna do in the, in the months ahead and we're gonna continue to release new equity ETFs onto the ASX and CBOE, which are the two exchanges here in Australia. Mm, okay. Um, and a final question, what um, do you, Chad, and you know, just ETF securities in general, how do you guys think of the market right now? Do you think we're at a bottom? Uh, it, that's a challenging one. I, I, I think the name of the game is to kind of ride through the volatility, which is to say there's going to be a lot of ups, a lot of downs. Um, but interestingly enough, if you pay attention closely to certain indicators, you know, there might be a ceiling to how high interest rates go, which means that eventually the stock market doesn't have to re-rate in price its cash flows because that's basically how they have expectation in terms of pricing future cash flows by way of interest rates. And as interest rates rise, uh, those cash flows in, in present terms go down. So that's why valuations have gone down. But in as much as interest rates begin to settle at higher levels, it might mean that you know equities start to calm down and they might find a floor. But in all seriousness, I mean, inflation's the outstanding question. And so if inflation is sticky and it doesn't respond to interest rate increases, uh, and interest rates have to go higher and higher beyond our expectation, that just simply means that stock prices are gonna continue to have to go through this process of repricing. Um, so that for us is a dynamic that we're watching. Mm. So you believe that ETFs are a good way to combat volatility? Uh, no, not, not necessarily because of course, you know, the equity volatility is transmitted through the ETF. The, the, the ETF is simply a vehicle that allows you exposure mm. to the underlying stocks that we cover. So anything that happens to the underlying stocks ripples immediately through to the ETF. And equities are referred to as risk assets for a reason because they do at times have dramatic price movements to the upside, to the downside. Um, so on that point, on that question, what I would say is, is it's great to speak with a financial advisor to better understand your individual circumstances, how much risk you can take on and so forth. Because um, no, I mean, these ETFs certainly have volatility. Gold though, mm. you know, as diversifier, we've seen investors on our side use our ETF GOLD to try to mitigate uh, downside equities and offset that in as much as gold's price is negatively correlated to equities historically. Um, but yeah, there, you know, these types of exposures are not free um, from, you know, vol volatility. Volatility is always going to be present. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, I think I will quite cut the questions there, but if I didn't get to get to a um, question, please email me and I'll pass them on to Chad. Um, who can answer them if he has time. But thank you so much, Chad, for joining me today and for such a great presentation. Um, I think we all learned so much about ETFs and ETF securities. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Perfect. Thank you.